The world changes quickly. Get the internet that moves even faster. Nextlight's gigabit fiber ties Longmont together and brings the world to your door.
Wow, a big thank you to Grupo Azteca Tlitzlikali. They do such wonderful performances, and we are very grateful for their blessing ceremony for our celebration this evening. I'm Ann Macca. I'm the Curator of Education here at the Longmont Museum. I'd like to welcome our online audience, and thank you so much for joining us for this 20th anniversary celebration of Day of the Dead at the Longmont Museum and with the Longmont community. Also, I'd like to say a big thank you to our museum members and our donors, to the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, and this year's presenting sponsor, sponsor for Longmont Museum's de, Dia de los Muertos, uh, Nextlight. And I'd like to introduce Lyra Nickley of Nextlight to give a few words. Hi, I'm Lyra Nickley, Marketing and Communications Manager for Nextlight. And on behalf of Nextlight, I'd like to welcome you to the 20th annual and first virtual Day of the Dead celebration from the Longmont Museum. This time of year is an opportunity for us to celebrate our heritage and remember our loved ones. It's a chance to make a connection because we know that connections only make us stronger. We hope you enjoy the festivities and we thank you so much for joining us. Feliz Dia de los Muertos. Thank you so much, Lyra. We really appreciate your support. Without that, we really couldn't do the work that we try so hard to do here at the Longmont Museum. Next, I would like to introduce um, Alondra Vasquez from Elevations Credit Union. Elevations is sponsoring this live stream opening reception this evening. Hola a todos. My name is Alondra Vasquez with Elevations Credit Union. I want to start by thanking you for your support and joining us tonight virtually. At Elevations Credit Union, we take pride in all the good work we do in our communities through college sponsorships, sorry, <laughs> college scholarships, community sponsorships, and financial education. We value our partnership with the Longmont Museum and are happy to celebrate such a wonderful exhibition that's become a special tradition for our community. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Alondra con Elevations Credit Union. Quiero empezar por agradecerles su apoyo y por apoyarnos esta noche, aunque no sea en persona. En Elevation, nos en Elevation nos enorgullece el trabajo que dedicamos a nuestras comunidades a través de becas, educación financiera y apoyando a, nos a nuestras organizaciones sin fines de lucro. A a valoramos nuestra asociación con el Museo de Logmont y estamos contentos de estar aquí para celebrar esta exhibición tan especial que se ha vuelto una tradición en nuestra comunidad. Gracias.
Thank you again so much for your support. Really, without it, we couldn't do our work here. Um, the next part of our evening will be a conversation between Tony Ortega and his son, Cipriano. Ortega's lifelong goal is to contribute to the better understanding of diversity by addressing the, the culture, history, and experience of Latinx people. Through his vibrant artwork, the exhibition includes painting, prints, mixed media works, illustrations from book collaboration with George Rivera, and a newly commissioned mural in honor of our 20th Dia de los Muertos celebration. That work will be installed downtown in Longmont very soon. So I'm going to turn it over now to Tony and Cipriano. Good evening, everybody, and uh, kind of cool to be part of this experience. Uh, hello, Facebook, and everybody who's watching. Um, so it's a conversation. Hello, Dad. Hello, son. So I guess uh, we'll start off by talking a little bit about your background and where you grew up. I've heard all this before, but obviously the audience hasn't before. So tell us a bit about your upbringing and where you grew up and such. Well, I was raised between New Mexico and here in Denver, and um, traveled back and forth with my maternal grandmother, uh, Trini Ortega. In fact, I'm paying tribute to her and my mother and my great aunt at, at an altar here. But I grew up uh, going back and forth between Denver, Colorado and, and uh, Pecos, New Mexico. I would spend the summers there and I would spend the winters here going to school. And uh, my grandmother was a, was a seamstress. She used to do alterations, make quilts, um, make clothes, etc. So I was always hanging out basically underneath the sewing machine cabinet. And my grandmother would give me a needle and thread and some material, and I would start sewing. So that was the beginning of my creative career. Also, my grandmother was a wonderful storyteller. She would share stories with me about her childhood, my mom's childhood, my uncle's. She would tell uh, old folk tales from the Southwest. So I think that was a way of me learning to visualize, to see things, to be creative. So my grandmother was probably the biggest inspiration for me being an artist. So I would um, be safe to say that uh, she was probably one of your favorite uh, people in your childhood because she primarily raised you, correct? Yeah, she was with me uh, basically 24-7, especially when I was really little. And then she would be the, the person that would pick me up after school. Uh, she's the one that um, uh, took care of me when I was sick. Uh, she, and because of her, um, I learned a lot about my identity, traditions, and culture. So. Um, I have uh, a lot to thank her for. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, it being uh, Dio de los Muertos, do you want to talk a bit about the people in the altar? Yeah, in the altar, I'm paying homage basically to the, the three women that I consider were my mothers. My mother, uh, Mary Martinez, uh, my grandmother, Trini Ortega, and my great aunt, Pauline Segura. Sort of, they, they sort of did the, the baby shuffle or the title shuffle, shuffle when, I was, when I was small. They all helped me in various ways. I didn't meet my father until I was 19 years old, but then after that I became um, more acquainted with him, got to know him a little bit, got to see sort of the, the DNA from that side of the family. And I'm also paying tribute to him there in the altar. And the other person I'm paying tribute to there is my stepfather, uh, Max Martinez. Mm -hmm. So let's go a little bit more into um, the art itself. And do you want to talk about the creative process about creating these stories with George Rivera and also involving me? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, George Rivera is a, a good friend of mine. He's a professor at CU Boulder. I've known him for um, well over 20 years. We started the, the first story, Jumping Over the Pyramid, which is not here. We have three other stories. And he came up with the idea of um, creating a, a storybook, a storybook about our culture, our identity. And he wanted to do it bilingually. And he wanted a story to come from, from us, from our culture. And so um, we had worked on a pr project previously to that at Our Lady of Guadalupe. He did, we did a fundraising, an auction, to raise money for, um, for scholarships for, for college students. And then he, uh, he started collecting my work. We became more and more friends. And he approached me one day, I'd like to do a children's book. Would you be interested in doing the illustrations with me? And I said, sure. And so he, um, he got to know me and my family, and he saw my son growing up. And from that, he... Um, he says, well, I'm going to make a story about your son and my two little dogs. And his two little dogs, Cholo and Vato, who are in all the images, and you. So I used you as my model. So you become the characters of all the stories of the adventures of Cholo, Vato, and Pano. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a bit about the book, in particular the ones behind us and on these walls over here? Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, back in 19, let's see, 1990. 
George Rivera organized a show with Chicano artists, and we went down to Michoacan to uh, Zinzunsan in um, Pátzcuaro, and we went there for Day of the Dead. We as Chicanos just didn't know a lot about Day of the Dead. We had been doing some art, uh, some reading, some research, but to experience is, is to experience it is, is, is incredible because you get to see people in the cemeteries, people clean off the graves, burning off the weeds, decorating with candles and marigolds. So that in informed my work. But we wanted to have it, the stories, or George wanted to have the stories with a little boy and two dogs, the Chicanos, learning about their heritage. So we involved you and them. So basically you were probably, I guess, eight or nine years old, and I staged you and the dogs, pretending that you're in front of a... A, a, a tomb, or pretending you were in front of the cemetery, or learning about marigolds. So I, I, I used photographs for, as an inspiration, as a point of departure to create the work. Mm -hmm. And all of these pieces are pastels, pastels on, on black paper. Yeah, it's interesting um, that you mentioned back in 92 how um, Dia de los Muertos really wasn't mainstream like it is now, so I think it's fair to say that we did the, before Pixar did Coco, we kind of did the concept before they did, but not trying to make claims, but anyway, I was just thinking about that. But yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about my experience, and I remember <clears throat> looking around at these paintings and being able to have the fond memories, because I have a pretty photographic memory of being able to photograph for these. At the time that I did them, I didn't really remember or think about what I was doing, I should say. I just didn't no, it was really for a book. I just figured you wanted to just take pictures, and we posed with the dogs and stuff. I remember Cholo and Vato uh, when I was a kid, and I just remember slowly understanding because I was how, how old was I when we first did the first book? Well, the first book you were probably three or four, mm -hmm. and then the second book, the Migrant Child's Dream, which is also here in the exhibit, uh, you were probably more like five or six, mm -hmm. and then uh, this. Uh, it, Day of the Dead was about 10 years old. Your mic, Dad. I remember your microphone. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I just remember a lot about being able to pose for these and being able to take those photographs and then transferring them into pastels. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, how you did that process? Uh, yeah, well, I, would, I had images or photographs, drawing studies from Day of the Dead from Botswana when we went. And then, uh, then I had those photographs of you and the dogs. And so I would use those as a point of departure, a way to inform the work, and then I would do some sketches, and then I would lay out the compositions, and then I would do the pastels. Um, one thing I always remember is when you were really little, uh, George and I, we would organize these, uh, these exhibitions with these stories. We would take them to a children's museum, uh, to um, pediatrics wards, to libraries, children's libraries, etc. And we would bring you along. Mm -hmm even when you were little, and George brought these little stamps, the paws of the dogs, and we would sign the, the books for the kids, and then you would sign, you weren't even old enough to even write yet, you would sign them, and then you would put the paw prints. Yeah, the, I remember that. You yeah, remember that? I do remember that, yeah. yeah I'm glad you remember that. I, that was a, a pretty fun doing that. And, and the other kids who were in the audience, because we'd read the story to the kids, mm -hmm. and they got a kick out of it, and then we would uh, sign the books for them, and you would too. Yeah, it was a pretty good like little tour that we did with that book, and I just have good fond memories about that a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk a bit more about the other books, um, regardless of, we just talked about the Dia de los Muertos book, but do you want to talk a little bit about the subjects of the, the most, let's talk about the most recent one, the one we did back in 2012. Yeah, the, um, in the uh, entry hallway here is the, um, the Cinco de Mayo book. Those aren't pastels, those are etchings, they're hand-colored etchings. So an etching is a, is a printing process, so I would do the drawings, then we'd make a film positive, and then I would burn it onto a plate. It was all photographic processes, trying to get the image on there. And then I would print them, and then hand color them. What was different about that book, it was in 2012. You were already in college, right? Yeah. You were at Regis mm -hmm. University. Yeah, I remember when you were working on it. So I found these old Polaroid photos of when you were a kid, when you were wearing different costumes, playing different characters. So I would take George's story, and then try to fit these costumes, and, 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 and that narrative follow more of a historical narrative? Yeah, I was about to say this particular most recent book is more about history and involving, you know, Cholo Vato and Pano's journey through those acknowledgments of um, history. Yes. So that's the difference between these other books and this one at Dio los Muertos is it's not, as, it's not as personal in the sense of being based off of family or experiences. It's more about the Mexican, Mexican history, essentially, correct? Right. Yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sequel about actually involves some real characters from history, yes. Where did you get those images, the historical ones? 
Um, many of those images I, I appropriated off of the internet, and some of the other I uh, images I uh, were photographs that I took, mm -hmm. like the one that you see out there with uh, you're, you're singing like a mariachi. Mm -hmm. I actually, Brian Webster in Denver in elementary school, they have mariachi uh, classes for kids, and I had some photographs, and I used that as the backdrop for, for that particular image. Yeah, what I like about your work and what we've done is that a lot of the things that we do in the backgrounds, at least, are things that were places that we've been familiar with, like George's house is the porches over here, and then the swing set, and the park is Woodbury Park. And I just remember what I like about that is I have a personal connection, obviously, to those backgrounds, but it's also not just involving backgrounds that I'm familiar with, but also the community of Denver as well, too. So. Yeah, George has been uh, an incredible person to work with. Uh, we've been doing this for over 18 years. We have a total of five stories bilingual. Uh, most of them are written in, as poems, and they're all um, couplets in rhyme. They're in Spanish and in English. So the, sp the Spanish translation isn't exact as the English, but it's close because he wanted to keep it in rhyme. Right. Uh, but George, specifically for the Migrant Child's Dream story that you can come and see here at the museum, he actually interviewed his aunt who traveled the migrant trail to the different states, Wisconsin to pick cherries. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, do you want to explain what that, what that really means historically? Yeah, well, um, migrant workers are the people that pick our fruits and our vegetables that, are, that have to be hand-picked. And they're very important to our economy because they help feed us. That's how we get those foods or those items to our grocery stores. So George has family members, and my wife has family members who are migrant workers. And so we wanted to pay homage to them, recognize them, let people know that, not, not keep them in the shadows. So this brings a story about a little boy who followed his family on the migrant trail through different states throughout the Midwest. And it's not just about your or my family experience, it's also, like you said, it's about, you know, people who still to this day do that occupation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's a very important factor in our economy and also in our way of being as a country, and I think we forget how much of that kind of story is important yeah. to tell everybody, especially, you know, common people who aren't familiar with that kind of lifestyle and uh, pursuit of survival, essentially. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the reasons the museum wanted that story here in Longmont, because Longmont has a history of growing sugar beets and having migrant workers pick the sugar beets. In fact, your grandfather, yeah. Frank Montero, who mm -hmm. I want to acknowledge also, he was a migrant worker and he picked sugar beets. So he'd pick sugar beets for part of the year, and the other part of the year he would go up to Washington and they would pick apples. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah, kind of a fun fact, uh, this is my grandfather's uh, leather jacket I wore tonight, kind of an homage to him. He's still with us, but he's uh, not doing the best in health at the moment, but uh, my thoughts go out to him. But yeah, let's talk about a little bit more about you know, the philosophical meaning behind Day of the Dead and the symbology and what it means for the Mexican people and where this whole concept comes from. Okay, well, um, yeah, it's basically it, uh, the, the, the pre-Columbian indigenous people of Mexico already had a day set aside or days set aside to remember their ancestors, to remember their families. Well, when the Spanish came, they brought Catholicism. Well, it mixed. The cultures mix. In fact, I consider myself a mestizo. I'm part of my cultured heritage is Native American, part of my culture is from Spain, right? And so it, it mixed, so it became part of All Saints and All Souls Day. Mm -hmm. okay? And um, so Catholic icons and imagery were introduced. Uh, then later on as it developed and it evolved, it started including photographs, which probably didn't happen until the early part of the 20th century. And so on an altar or at the gravesite, you, there's, there's, a, there's a feeling that the spirits have a divine right to come back and visit us. Well, they had to be able to find that way back. So they used candles to light the trail. They used the marigolds, the scent of the marigolds and the color to bring them back. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they recognize themselves when they see photos of themselves. They put their favorite food or their favorite uh, crossword puzzle, that's what I did for my grandmother, or hearing aids from my aunt. So when they come back and visit us on those days, they can say, oh, this is, these are people here on earth that are remembering us. And it's not only just for the spirits to come back, it's also a way for the people who are still living on the earth to be able to use materialistic items to remember their loved ones because it's a way of, we forget how much, you know, energy and time we put into materialistic items and just myself seeing those things on the altar remind me of, you know, Pauline and Mary and, old, and, and Victor as well too. So it's, it's an interesting, beautiful practice, I think. I think that's why a lot of people beyond the Mexican 
uh, people really find it a quite a, a moving festival and a, an event and a way of living. Yeah. yeah, we call it El de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead, right? But in a lot of ways, it's the day for the living. I mean, we're the ones who celebrate, mm -hmm. we're the ones who are remembering, we're the ones who are paying homage to, right? And what's, by going down to Zinzunzan, Mexico, in, in Michoacan, it made me realize that people in Mexico take time off. They stop working, or they stop going to school, because kids participate, teens participate, seniors participate. It's really a family event. Uh, I remember when we finally took you to Oaxaca, mm -hmm. you were like an eighth grade, I believe. Yeah. And uh, you asked me, well, what are we gonna do in Mexico? And I told you, well, we're going to cemeteries and we're gonna spend the night there. And, um, do you remember that reaction when I told you that? Well, for me, I don't think it was very much, that's what's interesting, I wanted to talk about that. For me, it wasn't a very big deal. But I remember telling my teachers of, uh, when I went to Denver School of the Arts um, about where I was going, because I had to miss a couple of weeks of school. And a lot of the teachers were like, you're gonna go and do what? You're gonna go to Mexico and like, because this is before, you know, Day of the Dead was, you know, popular. But for me, going back to your question, is it's not really uncommon for the Mexican people and, and other indig indigenous cultures around the world to embrace, you know, the calavera or the skull or to see literally death and to make, not humor of it, but to make it humanized because it is part of the human journey. So to answer your question, it wasn't a big shock for me. I mean, to play with the candy skulls and the little puppets and, you know, the shrines and the Catholicism behind it. I didn't necessarily understand all of it, but I think... Um, I understood the bigger meaning of it when, even when I was younger. So, yeah, definitely. So, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, Good. do you remember Cholo and Vato? Yeah, I do. I do remember them. Yeah. yeah. What do you remember about them? I just remember, you know, George having those toys in the back of his car that he would get for the dogs, but he would always let me pick a couple of them before they tore him apart. <laughs> That's the biggest thing I remember as a kid. Yeah, I remember I would meet George at my studio, and uh, you were really little, and you would be running around, and you'd be touching the art, and you'd be touching art materials, and George would, every, every two minutes, would say, aren't you getting nervous? He's touching that stuff. And I thought, no, we, what, that kept you entertained, right? Like, yeah, no, I, st I still touch some of your stuff so, in the so studio. So <laughs> when George and I would have, were having a conversation about putting these books together, or he would be looking at the art, my, my son was touching some pastels, or I was working on a tile mural. Yeah. And I was work, laying it out on the, on the floor to see what it looked like. And he would move one color to another area, and George would get all nervous, like, are you going to let him do that? It's keeping him entertained. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that kind of relationship still develops even now. I mean, I do my own art and still need your power tools and stuff, and you're up there working or teaching and whatever, and I just go up there and grab what I need and go down and work on it and come back and put it <laughs> away. So the behavior really hasn't changed that much. So, yeah. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Are we? Yeah, about two minutes here. But I just wanted to kind of go back to the idea of, you know, Day of the Dead and understanding, you know, where it comes from. But also just kind of want to ask you, um, what would you like to have on your altar? If, I mean, obviously you won't be there, but if I, if I do it for you, what, what do you what, how do you envision it? Well, I would hope you'd put some pastels on there. You'd I should be some, taking notes here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, have some paint brushes, maybe some acrylic tubes, right? Um, Oh, you know what you definitely have to put on there is that apron. Yes. And my grandmother, I have this apron that my grandma, she was a seamstress. So when I was in art school, she knew I had to get an apron. So she would make that for me. So I have this apron that's made out of denim, and it's got layers and layers of paint. Yeah. So it's almost bulletproof. And I had to fix the straps, remember? Yeah, fix so. the straps. So I've had that apron probably 40 years, God yeah. since I was in art school. So you'll have to put that on the I do, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's a way of... Not making light or thinking death is silly, but being able to understand that it's a part of life. And obviously with COVID and everything that's going on, it's a much more serious in-your-face subject, even especially more so now. But I just wanted to, for anybody who's lost, lost loved ones um, during this time period, I think it's really important to look at these, you know, type of practices and be able to just find comfort in those things. So yeah. I, think, uh, I think that's a good way to wrap it up. So, but yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I hope you can come to the museum. and wonderful conversation to be a part of. So thank you very much for taking the time to be with us this evening, and thank you for sharing your artwork with our community. So we have gotten to the portion of the evening where we are going to recognize and honor some of the founders of this celebration. Um, 
I'm going to start by reading a statement from Jill Orr. She was the curator of education before me um, and was responsible for initiating this celebration, bringing these community members together, and kind of getting it going. So I reached out to Jill to see if she wanted to add something to the conversation this evening and tell us what it has meant to her to see this celebration grow and change within this community over the past 20 years. Jill said, good evening. I'm honored to be part of this very special celebration. It's hard to believe that it has been 20 years since we began this incredible journey together. I could have never imagined in 2001 when 170 people attended the first event that Dia de los Muertos would become one of Longmont's signature multicultural community events attracting thousands of people, becoming the largest in Colorado and one of the best in the U.S. Wow. I remember the first event extremely well. It was downtown in the former museum building on Kimbark Street. I had recently come on board as the new curator of education when Marta Clevenger, the museum's director, asked me to create programming for an exhibition called Mexican Folk Toys. Our goal was to connect with the Latino community. Fortunately, our friends and colleagues, Caroline Gonzalez and Carmen Ramirez, were more than willing to help. Not only did they encourage our team to connect our programming to a holiday celebration such as Dia de los Muertos, but they also helped open doors and introduce us to several people in the community. During the first years, we forged new relationships and partnerships with people including Carla, uh, sorry, Carlota Loyola Hernandez at Casa de la Esperanza, Marta Moreno at El Comité de Longmont, Mary V. Hill from Alternatives for Youth, and so many others. I wish I could name everyone personally, but we'd be here all night. We've listened, we've learned, we've laughed together, and we've cried together. By coming together to create, this, to create and build Longmont's Dia de los Muertos event, we found common ground. While the programs on the exhibits are undoubtedly important vehicles for our work, what has made this event incredibly successful are the trusted relationships, the friendships, and the ongoing support among our communities. It's because of collective generosity. It's because of all of you. To this day, I'm incredibly grateful for being part of something so impactful, authentic, and genuine. It's been an absolute joy to see how it has continued to evolve over the years. I can't wait to see what's next. Jill Orr, Executive Director with Love, Oregon. So just like Jill said, I feel so honored to have inherited responsibility for this event and the exhibition, to have inherited the relationships that she began to build within the community. And we have some of those people here that she mentioned this evening. So first I'd like to introduce Carmen Ramirez to speak for a little bit on what it has meant for her to be a founder of this event and to see it grow and change in this community over the years. Carmen? Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really honored to be here tonight and to be talking after 20 years on something that started with a very simple question. And the question was, why don't Latinos come to the museum? And then our response was, we didn't know we were welcome. We didn't know we were invited. And what do you have that would attract us? So that's when, with Martha Clevenger and Jill Orr, we started reaching out to the Latino community. And I think what is so important is not just the opening of the doors, but it's the gems that you bring in through the doors. If we look at now, 20 years later, what we started with bringing in folks that knew how to make wooden toys. We've brought in artists. More importantly, our community altars. These are people from the community that come and they share the stories of their families, the pain of those they have lost, the gratitude of being able to display not only their culture, their heritage, their food, but to share that with community. I think that's so important over the last 20 years. And I've been involved with making altars, my own personal altars, which has given me the opportunity years uh, to mourn people that I've lost from my family, to remember them, remember by their favorite foods, remember something, maybe a cup, maybe a little figurine that belonged to my aunt. Uh, so that kind of connection to community. But more importantly, to share that with the rest of the community so they can learn about us. But they learn about us as a Latino community by looking at us as an asset, a gem, 
as we share our hearts, we share our stories, and we share everything about our community. And I think that's really important because if we're going to have a community that is inclusive, values everybody, and understands how to be multilingual and multicultural, we need it to start with our Latino community. Um, and as Anne was reading Jill's uh, piece where she was talking about how many other people came forward, Marta Moreno and Mary V. Hill and everybody else that came forward, and they too shared. But again, it was because they wanted to come forward and highlight the gems in our community, the gems in our culture, the gems in our food, and share that with our community. And for that, I am grateful to everybody that has shared over the last 20 years and hopeful that the next 20 years, we're going to have a bunch of other people that are going to be sharing their ancestors, sharing their stories and their food. Muchas gracias a todos. Es un honor estar aquí con ustedes después de 20 años, pero más importante es un honor que ustedes han compartido de parte de la comunidad latina. Gracias. Thank you so much, Carmen, and thank you so much for your participation. Thank you for everything that you've taught me. I really appreciate you. <sighs> Sorry, guys, now I'm going to cry. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Marta Moreno. She's become a really important person in my life in the past few years. Marta is a really powerful and wonderful woman. She is a strong member of the community. She's one of the founders of El Comité de Longmont, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. And she was also one of the founding members of Longmont Museum's uh, Dia de los Muertos celebration. So, Marta, would you like to come up, please? Buenas noches. Good evening. My name is Marta Valenzuela Moreno, alias known in Longman like the Burris, number one. Don't forget that. I've been part of, a, of a, the museum for the past 20 years when the founders were Carmen, Jill, whatever. It's been, it's been an honor, my pleasure, to bring to the museum this cultural event. Because when I moved out here, I said, what goes on in Longman? And in the museum, he said, the Dia de los Muertos, yeah, uh, we should. They wanted to build an auditorium. I said, what for? We have the museum. We built an auditorium in the museum, and we don't spend money on another auditorium. So I've been part of the, of the uh, Dia de los Muertos, bringing memories from my family. I'm a family of one dad, three moms. My dad had one, his first wife. The second, he had five. With my mother, he had about 13. So it's un chorro, a whole family. It, this year, I added my brother, David, who I called El Pacino Valenzuela because he resembled a lot, and all my brothers and sisters. And to me, be, having the altar has been very personal because I bring the stuff that my mother used to do. She used to wash by handboard, make tortillas, chile, no mole, you know, chocolate, everything that you see there, my mother and all are my brothers and sisters. And my father was a tough man, you know, you don't mess with Mr. Valenzuela, you know. Everybody, when he whistled, you had to be home. And we, he was very strict, very loving father, my mother and my brothers and sisters. Many of them make, uh, were in the, in, in the military, you know, Navy, Army, um, Marines, and all, you know, they all served, and I am very proud of a, of a big family. I just lost my brother, by El Pacino, in August the 31st. I was able to go see him in Fort Worth. Even though of the COVID, I said, I don't care, I have to go. So I went, and he was still there, and I, you know, when the person is dying, the last thing that goes is your hearing. So I said, Brother Davi, it's time to go. That's okay. You can go and join my mother and my father, and my brothers and my sisters. And you save a spot over there for us because we will soon join you, you know, when it, our turn comes about. It's been a very honor, grateful to be part of the museum and to show what culturally, you know, competent the museum has become, you know, allowing us to bring our cultural and our 
and, and introduce our family how we grew and what we used, you know, in, in, in our daily household. Ha sido un placer ser parte del museo, de poder exhibir a toda mi familia con todas las cosas que mi mamá usaba en casa. Cuando hacíamos tamales, lavan la, a mano, el pozole, las tortillas, el lavadero, para todo el chorro de hijos, hijas que mi padre estuvieron. Eh, esta última vez fui a ver a mi hermano, el último, que le, yo le llamaba a Pacino Valenzuela, porque tuve su gorrito y se decía mucho a él y tuve el, el, el honor de ir a, a despedirme de él y si el hermano ya es tiempo, está bien que te vayas allá a unirte con mi mamá y papá y mis hermanos y guardar un campito para nosotros cuando se nos llegue el tiempo. Eh, todo lo que se representa, mis hermanos, y he eh, estado involucrado en el museo, ha sido un gran honor. Esta ciudad ha sido culturalmente, you know, eh, reconociendo el Día de los Muertos para todas las familias que han podido uh, llevar a cabo sus altares. Es un, un respeto para nuestros seres queridos que se han, se han ido y todos los demás que están aquí este, poniendo sus, sus uh, uh, altares con sus cosas que han sido muy favorables. Doy un mil gracias al museo, a Anne, todos los que han estado aquí. Thanks to Anne and all the staff that has allowed us, you know, to be part. It's an honor because when I moved here, he has a long man. So Marta is here, the Burris is here. We're going to do a lot and learn. Gracias. Buenas noches. Dios los bendiga. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Marta, so much for sharing your family, your history, your culture, your language, um, your traditions with this community, and being such a very important and strong leader as well. Um, the things that you've done for this community are going to last forever, so thank you. Um, next, we have one more, one more person to hear from this evening, another strong woman who's been a leader in this community for many, many years. Um, a former Boulder County Commissioner and a former representative. Um, I'd like to welcome Jana Mendez to please come forward. Thank you, Ann. Um, I'm very thrilled that El Comité's uh, founding fathers who have passed away are being honored here. Uh, Ed Navarro, or Moon, and Tony Tafoya, and my ex-husband, <laughs> Richard Mendez. Um, we have all brought mementos and things that they loved. Um, Ed and Tony were, I think, president four times each of El Comité. They were there the first night when we all came together after the shootings, and they stayed with it for many, many years. Um, Ed came to us from uh, Pueblo, and Tony from Santa Fe, and they really made Longmont a part of their lives. Richard was born in Longmont in the house that still stands on Terry Street where his mother died. And um, they were all outstanding men, and we miss them very much. Uh, all the children and grandchildren honor them daily and remember them. Um, you can come and see some of the things they loved and cherished in their lives, and um, I hope you will appreciate what they gave to the to the city of Longmont and to peace and justice, because it was very necessary at the time, and they gave and gave and gave. Um, Ed was a, a wonderful attorney and helped many many people with their issues over the years and was a great photographer as well. 
He uh, was a photographer of many, many sports teams all over the state, I think. He loved it. And Tony was a man of peace. I think he coined the El Comité from something he had done earlier. And, um, and he was there the first night, too. Um, I have wonderful memories of these uh, gentlemen. And after Rich's and my marriage ended, he married a wonderful woman who was a fellow teacher, not at his school, but, and they were able to travel the world all, every vacation. And some of the places you went, China and uh, Hungary and England and Africa are remembered on, on, the, uh, on this occasion. And I want to thank the museum for their wonderful work in making sure the culture is recognized, the wonderful uh, Latino culture in Longmont. Um, Richard was very proud of his heritage, as were Ed and Tony. And I think we don't want to remember, but we must remember that there were days when my uh, Richard's brothers came back from the Korean War and there were still signs up that said, no dogs are Mexicans. It was a terrible time and I think it's changed, but we must always remember because history cannot be allowed to repeat itself. Thank you, Anna. And, and uh, I hope you'll come and see the beautiful displays. And thank you, Jana, for sharing your words with us. Thank you for your service to the community. Thank you for everything you do. Um, I also just want to thank our audience. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you for supporting the museum. We invite you to come and see the exhibit. It opens tomorrow. It will be up until January 9th. So you've got plenty of time to come in. Make sure to wear your mask. Um, and we're open Tuesday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, also, don't forget to check out additional live stream performances. Our celebration's not over yet. This Sunday, we have a local talent showcase featuring a number of performers that you will recognize from festivals past. And then again on Sunday, November 1st on Day of the Dead. Every week, check our Day of the Dead website, longmontdayofthedead.com and longmontdiadelosmuertos.com, where you can find new content every week about the history, the traditions, how to build an altar, the food, the arts, the crafts, all the different ways that the celebration is held in different parts of Mexico and Guatemala. So we welcome you to check that out every week for new information. And of course, we have, um, since we can't have a festival this year, we can't all come together in person, we have free celebration kits. We've made 500 of them. We'll be handing them out to the community. So check our website for those details to find out when and where you can pick up yours. Um, and just one more time, a big thank you to all of the people who have made the celebration so wonderful and who have made it grow and thrive for the past 20 years. We hope you'll join us again on Sunday for the next performance. Be well. The world changes quickly. Get the internet that moves even faster. Nextlight's gigabit fiber ties Longmont together and brings the world to your door.